Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to all the friends of Cross Border Talks. This Cross Border Talk is going to be very particular because my co host and friend Vladimir Mitev is going to be our expert in this special issue. And we are going to discuss a couple of things about Bulgaria, his homeland. Well, you might have perhaps heard that Bulgaria is a pro Russian country. You might also have heard that Bulgaria is a country ridden with corruption, and if corruption is destroyed, then there will be a huge new era for Bulgaria and Bulgarian Bulgarian citizens. Well, uh, those are myths. Those are some cliches that deserve to be discussed, that deserves to be rebuked, perhaps, and nobody is better to give you a clue about how Bulgaria is really like than a guy who has lived there all his life and who has watched uh, Bulgaria's political life sometimes with interest, sometimes with despair, sometimes with hope. Well, Vladimir, hello. Hello, Malgujata. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Let me just say that uh, I don't have a really specific uh, insider knowledge, but I'm just maybe somebody living here. And I am uh, maybe uh, trying to make sense of things which sound a little bit um, uncoordinated sometimes or a little bit uh, unconvincing. So let us make a try to to have a little bit different look at uh, Bulgarian society and politics. Yes, indeed. Especially that you have changed your government for I don't know what time in a row. And uh, this is not the last change, because as you told me, this is going to be a caretaker government just for a while, and you are going to vote again. So what is the political situation now? Who is leading your country in these unstable times we are living? Well, um, what we have now is a government uh, was formed um, under the ages of the president, Rumen Radev. And uh, apparently it is uh, full of uh, people who are uh, somehow pro radev or um, who are opposing maybe some of his political opponents. Um, for example, uh, these days, uh, a few days after the government was formed, there are a lot of discussions about uh, conflict between the leader of the Socialist Party, Cornelia Ninova, and uh, Rumen Radev or some of his people some of his ministers, whatever. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's always um, uh, tricky to, to discuss Bulgarian politics because we, people are very mixed with one another. For example, now Cornelia Ninova and Radev seem to be in a conflict, but uh, um, just uh, when when the first mandate of Radev was... Uh, the, the first elections for uh, the first mandate of Radev took place, it was Cornelia Ninova who launched the name of Rumen Radev in Bulgarian politics. And, uh, for example, our leaders, listeners might have heard that uh, uh, recently there was some division between the former Prime Minister Kirill Petkov and Rumen Radev. Uh, but uh, we also need to remind that it was Rumen Radev who launched Kirill Petkov and Nasen Vasilev, the duo of the previous government, the strong duo of the previous government into politics. And they also asked the people to vote for Rumen Radev at the second uh, for, for his second re-election election for the second mandate, which took place in the end of uh, previous year. So, in fact, Bulgarian politics is very mixed. Our politicians are in all types of combinations with one another, and uh, may, maybe that is one thing I would like um, somehow to say because I'm I'm getting tired of all this branding and rebranding. Who is pro-Western, who is Russophile, uh, the same people usually can be categorized in both ways, uh, I mean, are categorized. And uh, another peculiar thing is that uh, we never find exactly uh, what is the truth about that. I mean, things are somehow fluid. And, um, uh, for example, for a long time, uh, there was some campaign against Borisov, our pre previous strongman in politics, and he was accused of being pro-Russian uh, because he built the Turkish stream pipeline. Uh, and uh, for apparently for a number of reasons, he was also pro-Orban in his orientation. But we need to remember that he was on very good terms with Obama, for example. And uh, the same thing with Radev, 
who, who when he came to politics, he was accused of being pro-Russian, but after that he uh, somehow assumed the three C's initiative as his uh, project uh, in politics, which is generally a project considered to be anti-Russian. So, in fact, uh, we get uh, a little bit of a more complex picture. Um, apparently, for any, my guess is really maybe for almost any politi- politician in Bulgaria, um, there are some um, ways to brand him in, in different ways, in even opposing ways. And I guess people get perplexed if they are not, um, if they don't have a compass or how can I say, it, if they don't have good notions to understand Bulgarian politics. And of course, I'm not uh, only, uh, I don't believe people should care so much about Bulgarian politics when they are outside, but in a way it is also telling about the international politics um, because um, we often hear about conflict between the USA and Russia, for example, but um, this Uh, countries or societies, they have also good examples of cooperation historically and uh, traditionally. Even uh, we may argue that um, there was never a hot war, if if I am not mistaken, between the USA and Russia. And even for anything which we, if we really start to think more deeply into the issues, um, we may discover that uh, the issues are much more complex. And maybe that's the reason I suggested that we have this discussion and uh, you also seem to be very fond of it. So let us continue with uh, some, um, let, let us say, uh, some alternative look to Bulgarian politics. So you say that everybody in Bulgaria can be labeled as pro-American, pro-European, pro-Russian, pro-whatever you want. Because the politicians enter all kind of constellations, they form all kind of alliances depending on a temporary need. What is then the force behind all these actions? What is their actual motivation? If this is not ideology and not geopolitics, what do all these people fight for? Um, It's too general or too large a question, Uh, but... um... I believe Bulgarian politics, like any politics in any society, is some kind of superstructure over the economic base or the power base in society. So um, we have um, not only this traditional geopolitical choice uh, between West and East, let's say, uh, but there are also internal power centers. For example, Boyko Borisov uh, was uh, his, is a general who came from in politics from the internal ministry. And Rumen Radev is a general who came in politics in, from the army. Uh, so I guess um, uh, all, uh, there are a number of internal interests in Bulgaria as well. And my guess is also that these uh, lobbies, let's say, who compete or uh, collaborate uh, in Bulgarian politics, they also have various inter- external partners. So it is a little bit tricky, in uh, my guess, of course, to to label uh, people so uh, univocally or so simply, so easily into one or the other category. For example, um, Kirill Petkov was um, uh, announced to be in recent months to be a pro-Western politician. Politician, okay. But uh, we need to remember that his coalition partner was the Socialist Party, which is traditionally considered to be aligned with uh, Russophile forces in Bulgarian society. And uh, if we look uh, at other uh, parties, we can also find some kind of uh, dualism, like, uh, um, for example, Rumen Radev is aligned with the opposition current in the Socialist Party. And uh, there were some um, interpretations that other parties also have a little bit of like a double player, like a twin, let's say, a smaller twin, for example, the Turkish Party and the uh, uh, there is such a people party, uh, or there some people hinted at um, certain duality, dualism between GERP and uh, Revival Party, whatever. So um, what we get, in fact, is that um, uh, it's very simple to say these are with this somebody is with the Americans or somebody is with the Russians. There are different types of Americans and Russians, and. Uh, 
Uh, I can certainly remember or recall the moment when, Boris, when Borisov was in power. He was on good terms with both uh, Trump, Merkel, Orban, Erdogan and Putin. Uh, so uh, I guess that, uh, that is interesting uh, uh, reality. Uh, I mean, uh, like Bulgarian uh, large-scale uh, or uh, high-ranking politicians trying to be um, some kind of a bridge between various uh, forces in the world. And uh, I, I can argue uh, that uh, the government of Petkov, which was formed in the end of 2021, was something like an attempt for collective Borisov in the Biden era, because Borisov was strong in the Trump era. And when Biden came, apparently some change took, took place in Bulgaria as well. So the Petkov government was formed by four parties, which were very different in uh, terms of voters or orientation. And my guess is that uh, they were trying to be some kind of collective Borisov, like being again this type of bridge between uh, various international forces and internal forces in Bulgaria. And of course, the idea was to uh, of that government was to somehow dismantle uh, the heritage of Borisov, which is a long story to be told. But uh, basically, Borisov for a long time was associated with corruption and uh, oligarchical power. So there was this idea of dismantling Borisov heritage. But uh, my guess is that it was again, uh, given that there were various political tendencies in government, it was some kind of a, a attempt for a bridge. And uh, uh, there are a lot of there is a lot of talk, a lot of passion when uh, Petkov government fell, but uh, maybe it started falling in the moment when uh, uh, the war in Ukraine started, and somehow internationally, uh, a part of the West uh, um, became in war, entered in war with um, Russia. So uh, I guess the, this government of Petkov was somehow set up for peaceful times. Well, that is a very interesting question. That is a very interesting issue that you raised, the very notion of a country that intends to be a bridge between East and West. Bulgaria is not the first country that has tried this strategy. Actually, most of those who tried to position themselves between East and West failed because there came a moment when they had to position themselves in one on, or another camp and the war in Ukraine was like the last moment of decision for the countries that had not earlier made their choice. But I wanted to ask you about a, a little bit different thing. Most of the countries that chose this bridge strategy explained that they don't want to belong to any blocs because being in the middle ensures, a good, ensures good living for the citizens because they can have profitable connections with both East and West. However, Bulgaria is one of the poorest countries in Europe. It is one of the poorest countries in European Union. So it seems that the strategy did not really work or there are different reasons for which Bulgarian citizens did not profit from this actually very good geostrategical location of the country. So what are the obstacles behind Bulgarians' failure? Why did Bulgaria did not develop even though there are so many factors that would seem that they are on the right way? Uh, first of all, I'm not sure that uh, being a bridge means exactly or always that you are some kind of a neutral country because apparently Bulgaria or even Hungary or other countries who are in the region, they have made a choice uh, with belonging to NATO and the EU and uh, looking for greater integration into, in the case of Bulgaria, to um, organi other organizations, uh, um, including the Eurozone, etc. Uh, so um, my guess is that uh, Bulgarians are very uh, satisfied in general with belonging to, especially to the European Union and to the West. And from this position, engaging not only Russia, Ra usually Russia is considered the East, but I think Bulgaria also has some cultural proximity with other Eastern countries, maybe to the Middle East. And uh, maybe that is also something which is uh, used uh, and known uh, by our allies. So maybe uh, Bulgarians are... Um, could be good in many directions, not only in one direction, let's say, if somebody decides to 
use uh, uh, the country for something. Uh, but uh, apparently, uh, a reason for Bulgaria, maybe there are many reasons uh, why Bulgarians are poor or have uh, social issues uh, and usually stand poorly in various social indicators. But uh, we need to remind ourselves um, uh, that uh, Bulgaria was industrialized in socialist times uh, on the basis of uh, close cooperation and close commerce with uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, in the times of transition, uh, for a number of reasons, um, uh, these ties were uh, cut or reduced significantly and a large part of the industry couldn't uh, sustain, could, couldn't remain in force. Uh, basically, there was a lot of bankruptcy, a lot of unemployment. Uh, many Bulgarians emigrated for uh, Western countries for social reasons. Um, so um, there was a price which Bulgarians paid in transition. Um, and um, um, I, I would guess that... Uh, the times of Borisov were a certain attempt to uh, to somehow uh, end the transition, uh, or rather um, make it in, or or if you wish, make it uh, um, some kind of uh, permanent state, like uh, a little bit of a static moment in the history of the country. But that turned out to be unsustainable. Uh, because um, uh, of uh, international situation, which, as we know, Biden came to the White House, but also internally, um, the flows of European money were uh, more and more concentrated into the hands of those who were in power, and uh, uh, various uh, political or economic uh, forces remained outside of this flow, so they somehow organized and took down Borisov. So now... My guess is that Bulgarians, of course, I'm always hoping and trying to look positively. So my, my hope is that Bulgarians now are moving towards some kind of a greater complexity of society, towards a, um, greater interiorization of standards, which are European or Western standards in various social spheres. And uh, of course, the society is any society is undergoing certain renewal. You can't just fix stop time in any society. So uh, after, we, I believe we are still continuing to shed the skin or uh, change our society after the times of Borisov. And um, that is happening in the real world, which also in which Bulgaria is also dependent on international context. And maybe um, in this uh, international context, uh, Bulgaria has, the Bulgarian leadership uh, has somehow felt another formula is needed for power. You said that Bulgaria need, uh, used to build its industrial power on the cooperation with Soviet Union. Of course, these times are gone, but perhaps this is cooperation that is the key to a kind of revival for Bulgaria, for Bulgarian economy, for Bulgarian society. It always contacts with external world used to help uh, such a small society to open up, to find partners and to find impulses for development. Where do you find potential partners for today? What projects can be successfully implemented? Maybe I need to explain here that um, uh, one hypothesis for the coming of power of Petkov was exactly that um, during Borisov era, there were very few foreign investment. I mean, if you compare with Romania, Romanian foreign investment uh, right now is, is, if I am not mistaken, around 90 billion euro, and Bulgarian is a little bit over 30 billion euro. And each year in the last uh, years, uh, maybe including coronavirus era, uh, Romanian investment were a few times higher than those in Bulgaria, foreign investment. So uh, Romania somehow, just to give an example, uh, somehow managed to, uh, for some reasons, to uh, get, to be more trusted by Western companies. Maybe it undervalued a lot the value of its worker, just as Bulgaria, but maybe it also somehow uh, had the policy of encouraging foreign investment for, through a number of initiatives. And for some reason, in Bulgaria, uh, the Borisov uh, era 
didn't attract a lot of foreign companies to Bulgaria, uh, at least not in, in that, in that uh, dimension which Romania had. And maybe the coming of power of Petkov was associated with this hope that maybe when somebody who is younger, somebody who is more business oriented and maybe who he has a wife who is Canadian, so maybe more somehow more Western, let's say, as an image or English speaking, including because Borisov was not English speaking person. Uh, so maybe we, when we have a young and bold person in power, we will attract more foreign investment. And I noticed that uh, in the Petkov era, which lasted only seven months, um, there was a lot of uh, interest towards possible foreign investments uh, and uh, a lot of attention was paid to a few uh, initiatives. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, um, any of the these one or two major uh, projects uh, somehow hit... Um, some kind of a backside, for example, in one case, certain financial fund which wanted to modernize the Bulgarian energy sector was uh, dubbed to be related to Russian interests. And that was a little bit of a scandal because, you know, we officially it was a pro-Western government. Uh, and uh, in another case, there was German investment uh, in uh, industry, but it turned out to be German of Albanian origin. So, in fact, it is very complex, in fact, to do change in Bulgaria. But I, I believe also one of the reasons for Petkov to be changed maybe is that uh, it, it is not enough just to have a human face. I mean, uh, if if the attempt was to, to make some kind of a Borisov with a human face, collective Borisov with a human face, like again, this type of uh, a complex uh, formula that satisfies any international and internal partner, partner in, in which everyone is in power and everyone is in opposition, maybe that is um, has not worked out. And um, um, I have heard previously in some, some a few years ago, some discussions on media, like uh, Bulgarian older elites complaining that uh, uh, there are no, no sufficient investment in um, Bulgaria. And uh, I'm aware that uh, for, from Western European point of view, uh, greater implication in Bulgarian economy is somehow always related with anti-corruption. So that is w- what turns out, comes out of that is that there is a complex uh, equation of power, basically, if a greater uh, amount of foreign capital is admitted to country, it changes certain power balances and uh, those who have uh, taken power during transition or part of them might be unwilling to cede power to new entrants uh, because uh, sometimes, uh, as we see in the case of Romania during the golden era of its anti-corruption, sometimes uh, this process of anti-corruption is very crude to the victims of uh, anti-corruption, of so um, so it's a complex relation and in a way I'm happy I'm not politician and I'm just some kind of commentator, if you allow me. <laughs> I guess that the issue of the anti-corruption is yet to be discussed in detail if we go back to the Balkan topics and I am sure we will because, as you said, the Bulgarian society is changing after the years of stagnation. There is finally something going on even if it is going on only on a very limited level, if within a limited circle of people of power, still there is something going on. There are the different relations are repositioned also towards Bulgaria's external partners. So there are reasons to watch what is going on in this strategically located place between Europe and Asia. Well, thank you, Vladimir, for this talk. I hope that you explained a lot of things about Bulgaria to our listeners. I hope that our listeners will no longer think that Bulgaria is just a Russian Trojan horse in Europe, because this is the worst thing you can think about this country. And, well, I would like to ask you to subscribe our channel, to listen to us in different platforms when we are present, and not to miss any episode of Cross-Border Talks. Thank you very much.